You cannot avoid conflict in an apocalypse. Yeah, it's basically, it's almost like nature reasserting itself. Something so critically changed that life as we know it is no longer feasible. Like, no, that's not how that works. You just yeah. die, your skin melts off, you die. And she goes, do you drink it or do you lay in it? And goes, there's not really a wrong way to use a margarita pool. <laughs> there's not enough concrete on planet sodding Earth. How do we live inside this new system yeah. where the rules are different? I think actually the, the better question to almost ask is, what system failed <laughs> like that caused mm -hmm. this? Life is actually incredibly fragile. Mm. And the conditions in order for life to flourish are highly particular. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Worldcraft Club, a show for writers who want to create rich, immersive settings that will bring their readers back time and time again. I'm your host, James, and today I am joined by Seth. What's up, Seth? I'm here. You are in the middle of like the writing sprint to end all writing sprints. It's like... Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about a pod. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, a topic today uh, that actually turns up in tons and tons and tons of media. Apocalypses, if that's... Can it be pluralized? I feel like when you have an apocalypse, there's, there's only one sort of definitionally. But, um, you know, cataclysms, events that like rapidly reshape an entire setting. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into it because I think this turns up all over the place from your typical zombie apocalypse to uh, what was it? There's apocalypse. There, there's the one where it's just they just want to show pictures of the world exploding. And so like they have like a one at the beginning, you know, like the world just sort of detonates. There's all kinds of stuff like this. Adventure Time is a post-apocalyptic settings, all kinds of stuff that just leans in on this and especially nuclear post-apocalyptic settings given the recent Fallout show that just came out. So Seth, do you have any experience writing about apocalypses? I do have experience writing about apocalypses. Right. They're actually one of my favorite settings and it's one of the things I like to think about the most. That seems not healthy. not because I want the world to end. Okay, yeah. But because I think that a world-ending scenario presents the most uh, clear-cut opportunity to explore people and relationships and all sorts of other um, really good meaty subjects. And do you think that's really like the core of value of one of these sorts of? like this, this sort of tool, is that it strips everything down. Yes. Because that kind of, that's kind of the vibe yeah. I got, is that you're almost kind of like, you, you, you pare down much of the setting to something that's more intimate and more character driven. I, I think so. I think that it introduces a threat that is different from your normal thriller, right? Yeah. So let's say, let's say you're writing a thriller Typically, that's going to be a um, one human versus another human. Yeah. The thing about an apocalypse is it adds an ambient level of stress to the entirety of the scene, to the entirety of the setting, that is going to force characters to make decisions outside of the scope of what they would normally decide. Yeah. So they're going to be forced into um, conflict with other people. You cannot avoid conflict in an apocalypse. Because... If, if it was real life and there's no apocalypse, if I'm getting into a fight with somebody over a resource, I can go somewhere else to find that resource. Yeah. If I'm getting into a fight with somebody in an apocalypse, typically there's only a little bit of whatever resource available and there's nowhere else to go and get it, right? And, and yeah. this does bring up interesting questions about localized apocalypses versus, versus you know, or cataclysms versus yeah. um, sort of broad apocalypses. And it is probably important to, to just stress that the way we use the term apocalypse isn't necessarily the actual meaning of the, of the term, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. we use it as shorthand in writing, in, um, in designing games, in whatever we're doing, making movies. We use it to signify an event that that radically changes the world, but doesn't necessarily actually end the world. In fact, it it never ends the world. There's yeah. always some world that we're exploring beyond the apocalypse, which is why post-apocalyptic has become such a popular term for this, this sort of genre. 
Yeah, I, I think I definitely prefer the term cataclysm, just some sort of like major inflection point in the setting, some mm -hmm. sort of disaster. Because like it can vary in scale as well, because like you can have, uh, as you say, the, the actual geographic scale, right, from a region to mm -hmm. a galaxy to, you know, all of existence. Right. And then you can have something like societal disruption. Mm -hmm. So like an example in, in some ways would be like, uh, I think dystopian fiction often is sort of some sort of post cataclysmic event. V for Vendetta is a little bit like that, where they, they had a massive social disruption and change that fundamentally altered the way society worked. Mm -hmm. And then they had, yeah, and, and, and that was the world that they were living in. So you can have scales as well, because you can also have ones that are uh, complete annihilation or mm -hmm. species, death of a species, an entire sapient species. Yeah. You can have uh, something that literally erases something from time, like a metaphysical, like, you know, annihilation yeah. sort of circumstance. And yeah. yeah, I know it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about different types of apocalypses. Yeah. And like, it's just like, I've been thinking about it because I've been obsessed with green apocalypses lately. Which like, is where the world takes over, right? Yeah. yeah, it's basically, it's almost like nature reasserting itself. So like, um, a really good example of this might actually be uh, the, the Last of Us. I think is a little bit sure. like that because it's uh, you get these zombies that were made from fungus. Like yeah. it actually wasn't a that wasn't man-made. You know, there right. wasn't a nuclear a nuclear holocaust, anything like that. It was just nature sort of reasserted itself. There are even factions in The Last of Us that sort of say we think technology was kind of a sin and we think like the world has sort of turned back the clock on us. And hmm. these settings are fascinating. Like Annihilation may be another good one if you've um, seen that uh, featuring featuring Natalie Portman. Was it Oscar Isaac as well? Um. Yeah, Oscar Isaac, yeah. Um, and, and like that was an interesting one as well because that was like this this weird... It was a green apocalypse in that like nature was just uh, changing very, very rapidly within mm -hmm. this space and adapting at such a rate that it was, it created these really horrifying things. It was, co it was cosmic horror, essentially. It was a lot of annihilation. But I would argue that it sort of fits nicely within this green apocalypse kind of thing. The, the horror of nature yeah. reclaiming human cultivated you know, spaces. I, I have always found apocalypses a little bit tricky. Yeah. Because there has to be a lot of hand waving. Let's take a green apocalypse, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a green apocalypse and you decide, okay, the world is going to start mutating at a really rapid rate. There's going to be a, another Cambrian explosion yeah. or whatever you want to say. And things are just going to be changing at such a rapid rate. In order for things, to, in, order for things in the world to shift so rapidly that humanity will not be able to come up with countermeasures and some of us will still survive... Mm the balance between between sort of the de how deadly it is and the, and how quickly it goes has to be fine tuned tremendously mm. right because if you have if you have a um, if you have a rapid evolution that is that is dangerous for humans and you don't give humanity enough time to come up with a solution we're all dead like yeah really seriously because so for instance any sort of airborne pathogen like we're all dead before we can come up with a solution yeah and so in apocalypses it's really hard to to figure out how to keep people alive enough that you have a story without then but ruining dead enough <laughs> yeah well but dead enough that yeah. there's threat yeah yeah because so uh, one of my one of my favorites to sort of play around with mm. um is the idea of some sort of airborne something airborne yeah. virus yeah, yeah. that um wipes out massive portions of humanity mm. uh wipes out massive portions or mutates everything it touches Right. The number of people who would survive something like that if it was just like introduced to our atmosphere. Yeah. Is incredibly small. Yeah. And they would probably be so spread out that within 60 years, they'd all be dead. Yeah. Right. Because the chances of a child surviving that very, very low. 
the chances of somebody who is in a secure facility somewhere with some sort of um, air filtration system that can keep it out, you know, there's not going to be a lot of those people. Yeah. And again, they're all going to be so spread out, the chances are humanity is just going to die within a generation. Yeah. Right? And so this is one of the real challenges in my mind for post-apocalyptic is that is that life is actually incredibly fragile mm. and the conditions in order for life to flourish are highly particular mm. the reason that societies didn't grow beyond certain s sizes for a really long time was that we just couldn't support larger populations right yeah. and it was only when the infrastructure starts to be created to do um, higher yields for food, um, more nutrient dense foods, uh, clean water, variety. Yeah. Like there are all of these things that you have to have in order for a large society to function. And so as soon as you move into post-apocalyptic territory, you, you're sort of forced, I mean, unless you hand wave it, which you can always hand wave things. Yeah, yeah. But unless you hand wave it, you're sort of forced into really low people count. But this is the thing about low people count. Societies with a very few number of people don't grow. They, they die. Yeah. Right? Because you have to have enough people in order to keep your, your species going. Right? You have to have a, a large enough group yeah. in order to keep your species going. And, and so any conflict between factions has has species ending potential yeah which would then change the way people think about conflict it would change the way people operate in terms of social structure right yeah more often than not though what post apocalypse or what being in a post apocalyptic setting can do for a story is it can take it can take um current social issues and magnify them yeah by pushing them into a conflict uh by pushing them into a conflicted world right yeah yeah it kind of it, it turns out the gain on yes. an existing problem that's a great yeah. way to describe yeah, it yeah. that's a great way to describe it but it does but it does present a real challenge for building an apocalypse yeah or building a, a post-apocalyptic society just because you don't you don't necessarily, or you can't necessarily have an incredibly lethal reason, right? Like even, even radiation. Yeah. Like if the world was irradiated, do you know how fast everybody would just die? Like fast. really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there would be no crawling through water, you know, irradiated yeah. water yeah, yeah, yeah. in the in the wasteland and then sucking down some pills to get rid of get rid of in your radiation yeah like no that's not how that works you just yeah. die your skin melts off you die it sucks yeah you, well you didn't make it sound good <laughs> like, it doesn't sound cool like you don't become a ghoul no um, you die yeah but no it's it's like it, it is it is complicated because like I, I think really like actually the critical thing with the apocalypse isn't the death count it's the infrastructure like oh, yeah. and, and that's kind of the killer thing is that like I, I think really a lot of apocalypses it's not so much it's not so much that X number percent need to die it's that some sort of domino needs to get flicked mm -hmm. such that chaos ensues I mean one common trope with apocalypses is, is looting <laughs> like it's like you know the end of the days comes it's like yeah i'm getting a tv you know so you start trashing stuff and like you know you get the you get people saying you know or, or it'll be somebody like joel being like i got out of the cities just in time you know kind of thing it's like before everybody started eating each other and like stuff like that and like that's um that's actually it. it's like this is kind of interesting because i've never thought about it like this is really an apocalypse or a, a cataclysm isn't actually like i, I almost prefer the term um like global inflection <laughs> like it's 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 not a it's not that the world like like you know x number of percentage people died 
It's that something so critically changed that life as we know it is no longer feasible. And there, and it adds, and it's got to add a layer of desperation in there. Infrastructure collapse seems to be the universal thing that needs to happen, and that could be a societal, yeah. political infrastructure, yeah. like sort of imagined infrastructure, or it could be the actual physical spacing of it. And I think that's a question, like, if you're writing an apocalypse, I think actually the the better question to almost ask is. What system failed <laughs> like that caused mm -hmm. this? You know what I mean? Was it like, and, and like, I get it. Like nuclear war is like one of those things where we look at it and go, the system that failed is big bombs went off and blew up all the urban centers. Like, but that is a system failing. It's just it hit population right. centers. You know, it was like the idea. Right. And it's like, ultimately the, the nuclear bombs are not, in a way, not the thing that caused the apocalypse. It was like almost like, right. The result. It was, yeah. it was the fireball that caught. No, it was the. But it's it's that sort of thing. It's that collapse that a re, a, a writer is interested in discussing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Less, less the, the actual effect, or or less the catastrophe, and more the how do we live inside this new system yeah. where the rules are different. Yeah. One of the a most bit of fish out of water to some uh, degree. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the most popular um, types of of apocalypse right now mm. is coming out of the the genre I write. Yeah. Um, so it's coming out of lit RPG, and it's it's fairly simple. There's some sort of system integration into the world. Um, portals open up, monsters start pouring out. A little Pacific Rim in a lot of ways. It, that makes me think of like yes. the kaiju just sort of start turning up at the bottom of the sea and they have to build robots and seawalls. Yes. Yeah. Because that's a completely. <laughs> it's like that, that is <laughs> that not just, feasible. I, that is not uh, feasible. There is not enough concrete on planet sodding Earth to cover right. every. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, carry on. Yeah. So <laughs> the. I, I think that that this idea has become so popular though because it solves this issue yeah right because it solves this problem of oh if our infrastructure doesn't work then we're all dead yeah because this is this is the piece that like i know we've talked about food and i'm sure we're going to talk about food again oh yeah but but people really underestimate how much our calorie dense food like how much free time our calorie dense food gives us and how little time we spend preparing it exactly yeah whereas you know when you don't have the infrastructure to make that really calorie dense food or to process food um in a way that will will stay will keep mm. all of your time just becomes about feeding yourself like everything you do becomes about feeding yourself. And, and there's a certain clarity in that. Like w one, one actual um, genre of post-apocalyptic that I learned about the other day, cozy apocalypse. Okay. Yeah. I didn't look to see if Dave cringed because like, I feel like that would be something that would set Dave off. Yeah, it's setting Dave off. But <laughs> so the cozy apocalypse idea is kind of this. And, and it's sort of, there is something very clarifying about losing everything, mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes when there are six choices of ranch dressing, you just get anxiety. You don't get ranch dressing, right? right? Like there's a sense in which like what, so the cozy apocalypse idea is this sort of, it's a little bit nihilistic, it's a little bit narcissistic, but essentially it's kind of like with all of the trappings of the world gone, I can just make a margarita pool. Like, you know, it's like, there's nobody else here. So there's a show called, I think it was The Last Man on Earth. And I just remember there was this scene where this other character finds one of these guys who, who thinks he's like the last man alive. And so he's kind of just living in a mansion. And she arrives and she's like, what are you up to here? And he's like laying in a kiddie pool that's full of margarita. And he's salted all the edges. And he's just laying inside it. And she goes, do you drink it or do you lay in it? And he goes, there's not really a wrong way to use a margarita pool. <laughs> and that that's apocalypse that is in a way cozy apocalypse. It's you have been can, stripped of it. Zombie land is another cozy apocalypse. Can I in some ways. Can I just submit that every way is the wrong way to use a margarita pool? <laughs> 
Well, it's clearly everywhere. Loop, loopy, no. loopy straw is very acceptable. Connecting they, loads of straws together, that'd be my opening move. I'm not uh, going to lie. Uh, <laughs> but so, Zombie Zombie Land's a cozy apocalypse, right? right? Because, like, effectively, right. the characters all find themselves and they find purpose for themselves in the end of the world. And we're actually quite useless people when the world was happening. But suddenly, when a guy finds out he's good at killing zombies, suddenly the dude who's just been like, you know, a bit of an outcast his whole life, Woody Harrelson, remarkably well played. And like, he's good at killing zombies. He finds a purpose for himself. Like, another character who's been a total loser his whole life, he just runs away from every problem, suddenly finds that running away is very effective in a zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And he survives. And he survives because of these rules. He's basically, like, a little bit, like, hidebound with all his rules, but his rules help him live. And, like, there was this sense in which, like, it brings out these elements of character in it mm -hmm. and sort of, like this concept that all the troubles are stripped away with it, which is kind of interesting. It's almost like the other side of sort of as, uh, an apocalypse. Usually with a, an apocalypse, you're seeking stakes, right? Like you're seeking... Yeah, so so that makes... That brings up something really interesting, yeah. which is that it seems that if you're going to have an apocalypse, the details of how everybody died or what the apocalypse actually is hmm. are less important than how you establish the rules afterwards. Hmm. Boundaries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Really, we're talking about boundaries. Because yeah. when, you, when you set up those rules, you're determining then the new system in which your characters have to live. Mm -hmm. And if, if those decisions or, the, or the, uh, the choices that you're giving your characters are not clear, if they're not a uh, weighty if they don't have stakes then they're not going to be interesting mm. and so stepping out of of sort of the real world into an apocalypse allows you to rewrite the rules in such a way that you get to choose what sorts of conflicts your characters have to struggle with what they have to deal with mm. which which ultimately ends up ends up giving you freedom as a creator to to set this up however you'd like right you can decide okay what is the actual struggle here and the apocalypse just becomes just becomes sort of trappings right yeah. it just sort of sets the the stage for again whatever conflict you want to explore yeah it's it's interesting because you can you can also sort of place an apocalypse temporally in different ways. So you can have the apocalypse that happened long ago, and usually this is like one of the tropes is a cyclical apocalypse, right? right? Like things just keep happening. There's a cataclysm every, you know, 300 years. People have mostly forgotten about it by this point. No one's like, you know, and oh my gosh, it's coming. Our heroes must prevent it. Uh, there is, you know, sort of, and, and that's sort of after an apocalypse and before another one. You can have some or in, in between intermittent apocalypse, apocalypi. Um, but then, <laughs> sounds like a really angry octopus. Um, multiple of them. But there's, um, you know, like it, it's, you can also have it where you are literally in the midst of the apocalypse. World War Z mm -hmm. was basically this, like all heck breaking loose. Um, it was a really, really good one. World War Z, actually the book, very, very different than the movie. The thing they had in common was the name, but that was about, <laughs> that was about it. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the actual book about that was how people figured out how to continue right. after it. And it was very much like, here are these people, here's what they did. And they like power dropped engineers and stuff into, into, into local, into certain towns that like had warded off the zombies, but most of civilization was behind the Sierra Nevada. And so like, it was like them uh, mountain range. And so it was about how like, they sort of coordinated these little pockets of survivors and like helped them get by. And like mm -hmm. suddenly actors were having to make ammunition and stuff like that because they were like, well, we've got no use for you anymore. And they're like, but we're rich. And it's like, not anymore, you're not. And so it was like, a, it was really, really interesting exploration of that. But like that, that's in, in the middle of the apocalypse. You have waiting for it to happen, the impending mm -hmm. doom, Thanos, right? The Avengers was like waiting for the apocalypse, which again, doesn't matter how many people you kill, it wrecks the infrastructure and changes the way everything works, which is why mm -hmm. those scenes post-snap 
were so fascinating. You know what I mean? It was like they, they were like they'd show like the way sort of society was working. Fifty percent of the people died. They had like grief support groups and things like that. And it's like a fascinating concept. And it allows you to sort of dive into a lot of these and gives you a lot of room to either build incredibly high stakes for a setting, or on the other end, you can make it incredibly intimate. Like The mm -hmm. Road was an incredibly intimate story. It was just a father and a son going on the saddest road trip ever, essentially. Like, mm -hmm. and that's, I don't know, it's interesting. This, it seems very malleable, I guess is my point. You can do a lot with a cataclysm. You really can. And cataclysms are, um, are one of the, I think they're one of the most evocative ways that you can set a scene. Mm. Because the one thing that all cataclysms have in common is loss. Yeah. Something is lost. And normally it's, it's actually a human element. Yeah. So when you have a zombie apocalypse, it's a human against all of these zombies, right? Their loved ones are zombies. Strangers are zombies. Their enemies are zombies. It's them again, like there's an intense loneliness to that, mm -hmm. right? When you have an apocalypse where, um, let's say it's a some sort of, you know, nuclear war. Okay, a lot of people are going to die. All of a sudden you have emptiness in the world, right? Like, again, introducing those elements of, of loneliness, but also introducing elements of, you know, ever-present danger, right? And these, these feelings are hardwired into us. Mm. And they're things that, that humanity has been afraid of forever. Yeah. You know, I think that we, we often think of apocalypses, because of the, of the world we live in, we think of apocalypses as like, these massive events that that drastically alter the entirety of the globe. Yeah. But a localized apocalypse back in the day was just as terrifying. When when the mountain next to you exploded and, you know, lava comes pouring out uh, onto your village and kills, you know, 90% of you because you can't outrun it, mm. the few people who get away the thing that they have to deal with, like they can go and they can rebuild. Humanity is resilient. Humanity can always rebuild. But those people have to deal with the loss of the other people that they know, of their home, of their mm. stuff, right? And so I think one of the things that's so evocative about, about cataclysms, about apocalypses, is that sense of, of loss. Right. And it's one of the things that actually makes a cozy apocalypse work because you have the juxtaposition between a, a, a setting that is just incredibly bleak and dark with this sense of relief or levity. There's, man, I, I wish I could remember what it was called, but I saw the first episode of an anime about a salaryman who goes through life and is miserable and then the zombie apocalypse happens and he's so happy that he doesn't have to go back to work that he just is like ecstatic and he's like running away from the zombies <laughs> in this like really gleeful place you know fighting them off yeah. and fending them off right and running away and is just so happy. I don't know if it's in an anime or if it was a music video, like an animated music video yeah. or whatever. Anyway, look it up. It, but the, it's playing with that juxtaposition yeah. between, between this really terrible situation and also the, the intense emotions that might be created, right? In his case, just relief that he doesn't have to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, I think that that if you're going to use an apocalypse, um, if you're going to have some sort of, uh, 
cataclysm in your setting. Yeah. Just understand that what's important about it is not the um, it's not the event itself. It's what happens as a result of the event. It's what happens. It's what comes out in the characters. Uh, it's the emotions that they feel because of the new rules that they are operating within. All right. All right. So I think that really wraps it up nicely. An apocalypse doesn't actually have to be a global event or an extinction event. And really, it's probably more characterized by a destabilization of infrastructure. A better term might even just be an inflection point or change in a world. This was radically common long, long ago when a small community would be wiped out by a volcano and everybody you knew is, is gone. You're forced to rebuild. You're forced to restart. But nowadays, we see it as more of a large societal collapse, something that goes wrong that causes everything to change. This is going to evoke a lot of feelings in the characters. They're going to be able to see the world in a new way. Some of them may experience joy because they don't got to go to work anymore. Other folks may find themselves feeling this intense loss and sadness at things having disappeared. It also forces a series of conflicts, things that we didn't used to fight about. Suddenly, we're fighting about them. It can serve as a great way to emphasize current social issues and have a discussion about them in sort of a, a sort of a, a partly removed way where you can turn the gain up on them like crazy and have like an interesting sort of conflict play out that can be really instructive. So this is kind of some ways that you can use an apocalypse in your setting or a cataclysm, if not only for just building stakes and being like, well, the world's going to end. I'd better do something. So with that, I want to say thank you to the folks in the Worldcraft Club server who honestly do all of my research for me at the last minute when I ask them. Thank you so much for pointing me in the right direction with a lot of this stuff. And uh, for James, I am James. <laughs> I'm James, and for Seth, producer Dave, and editor AJ, this has been another episode of the Worldcraft Club. Bye. Just put him, put him right, right here. Close, yeah. Seth made it when I was in the chair. I'm staring into AJ's soul.